is the state of the U.S. race now informing this government's Team Canada strategy to U.S. relations? Industry Minister Francois-Philippe Champagne is leading that campaign, and he is with us live now from the Liberal Caucus Retreat in Nanaimo. Minister, good to see you. Thank you for making the time. No, it's good to be with you, obviously, Vashi. Did you, Minister, watch the debate? And if you did, what's your takeaway? Yes, I did. I did that, as you would expect, as someone who's co-chairing kind of Team Canada effort. Uh, what I thought, I think, you know, both candidates stated their cases. It's always informative and interesting for us to watch uh, the different aspect of the campaign that's going on in the United States. My job and our job is to be best prepared in order to defend uh, Canadian interests. So obviously watch that with much interest and certainly uh, we're going to continue our engagement. You know, the good thing is that I think that the message we've been bringing forward in the United States around security, around supply chain resiliency, around a growth agenda for North America is something I would say, Vashi, that resonates both with both Republican and Democrat. The Republicans say, we like you, you talk business. And the Democrats say, we like you, you're aligned on policy. So our, our frame uh, remains. I've heard the debate and I think that our frame to present why Canada is this indispensable relationship uh, is very much relevant from what I heard yesterday. I think a lot of Canadians, in particular off the beginning of the debate, would have heard uh, quite a bit of an exchange around the prospect of additional tariffs on imports, which is something that the Trump campaign and Donald Trump himself has spoken about frequently, although somewhat inconsistently when it comes to the details of what it will entail. Have you or anyone on Team Canada or among, you know, in the federal government been able to secure any assurances from the people around Trump that Canada and Canadian exports will be exempt from tariffs like that? Well, I took note of his comments, obviously, yesterday and also what he commented on with the so-called what's called Project 2025, uh, which you saw a number of things, uh, but he said that was not necessarily um, his agenda. Uh, what I would say from a Canadian perspective, what we have done is that and what we are communicating to our friends down south, whether it's mayors, whether it's business people, uh, whether it's uh, congressmen and women, senators, uh, is to make sure they understand the, the vastly integrated nature of our economy. It's true, for example, in semiconductors. You know, when President Biden came to Canada and spoke at the House of Commons, in his words, he said that we are interlinked because 80% of the semiconductors manufactured in the United States are, are packaged and tested in Canada. Then we talked about critical minerals. What are we going to need, obviously, to power uh, the decarbonization revolution that we're seeing? Uh, we talked about energy. So we have a number of places where we are more integrated than ever. And I think that is something that is resonating. You know, we had uh, Jake Sullivan as well when we're at a cabinet retreat in Halifax. And I think these things are, are I would say, far, far more understood now because in the United States, like in Canada, economic security is national security. And when you look at that in that lens, I would say Canada, we've moved from just being nice to be strategic. And that's how I call this indispensable relationship. That That's what we're bringing every time we go. When I went in Nebraska, when we're engaging, and we're right. engaging in places outside of Washington and Los Angeles and New York. We're bringing that message to places like Nebraska, Oklahoma, Louisiana, Texas, Florida, sure. so that they the, see us as a strategic partner. The example, Minister, though, uh, respectfully, that you referenced was Jake Sullivan, who's part of the Biden administration. My question was centered on the prospect of Trump getting reelected and imposing additional tariffs and significant tariffs on imports. Uh, and again, I'll ask it once more. Have you been, I, I know you've made this argument that makes a lot of sense, right? That, that we're so integrated and that it ultimately will cost Americans more if those tariffs are levied. We heard Kamala Harris make that argument and get dismissed by Donald Trump. So my question to you is whether or not you have received any assurances from the Trump campaign or people around him even that Canada would be exempt from the kinds of uh, uh, punitive tariffs that Trump is threatening. Well, I, I hear you, and I think you said it in the best possible ways. If you look at the economy of the future, uh, you're going to need critical minerals, for example, for semiconductors. And you would probably agree with me that this is the DNA of progress. You would need critical minerals for, um, you know, batteries and electric vehicles. You need energy. So the type of things that we offer as Canada uh, makes us, in a way, uh, indispensable to the U.S. economy. So that's that's certainly how we present that to uh, people on the Trump administration to make sure that they understand 
kind of is the, this Canadian exception. Well, I would say people understand that. I had a number of discussions with folks, and they said, you see, uh, no one is going to commit right now, but they understand what the Canadian exception in a way. People understand that, you know, uh, you're going to need semiconductors to be successful in the digital economy. Uh, you're going to need energy and power, and Canada is already a partner. You're going to need critical minerals for decarbonization and the EV transformation you're seeing. So when you're talking like that, people understand that because of the, uh, I would say our supply chain are more integrated now than ever, uh, people see that as if you want a growth agenda for North America, Canada has to be at the center. So that's kind of the argument we're putting. And I would say this is well received by the people who worked around him. So we're going to continue to obviously state our case. Well received, but I take from, from your response that they haven't said, don't worry, Canada won't be a part of this. But well, that would be premature at this stage. You know, we're talking to, to people on both sides. What, what, what I can do and what we should do is to state our case. But when you start with facts and you talk about strategy and, you know, being strategic and you talk about national security, I would say that is transcending party lines because national security, if there's something that our friends down south understand is national security. So when I present that, it's always about this is in your national security interest. We need to do that together. You even seen uh, the United States Department of Defense recently invested in one. The only cobalt plant in North America happens to be in Ontario and cobalt, Ontario. They invested in that. So they understand right. that we have to work together to make sure that, you know, we are more resilient and we have an agenda for growth in North America. Uh, Minister, before we go, you're coming to us from the caucus retreat in Nanaimo ahead of two significant by-elections, one of which occurs in, in your home province in Montreal. Uh, are you worried about that by-election? No, we are taking every step to win. Uh, we're working hard and making the case to voters. Obviously, you know, in a by-election, it's always a bit challenging to make sure people focus. You know, in a general election, everyone knows that we need to inform people. But we're, we're making the case and, and making sure people understand, you know, uh, that we're fighting for them every day. We understand their everyday issues about affordability, housing, uh, the type of thing that are day-to-day -day issues that you, you talk at the, uh, at the uh, kitchen table. And, and see, we're, we've been there for you. We're going to fight for you. And we're presenting a vision of the country, which is about possibility, opportunity. And, you know, optimism is, is, is contagious. So that's what I'm trying to bring on the campaign. That's what our candidate is bringing on the campaign. Is your sense, though, Minister, with all due respect, that Canadians are optimistic about the future? Because that is not borne out by any data in any public opinion poll in, in the last six months. And I guess I wonder why, to the voters in that Montreal by-election or voters across the country, you are emerging from this caucus retreat, Minister, without anything new to propose to Canadians. The message seems very clear from the Prime Minister and your colleagues. We're going to keep doing what we're doing, and eventually Canadians will appreciate us for it. Well, I would say I, I would disagree with what you say. I, I think Canadians are hopeful. I mean, you know, we have, you know, I was at the G7 recently. My colleague was saying, we would trade our problem for your issues. We have issues in this country. We're working on them. But if you look at the state of the world, that the two, you know, the big trends, decarbonization, digitalization, you know, we're, we're a magnet for talent in this country. We have attracted record level of investments. Uh, we have the critical mineral to power the economy of the 21st century. We have renewable energy. Uh, that is the envy of the world, and we have access to 1.5 billion consumers around the world. We've been blessed by geography. Uh, I would say when you look at the world today with a lot of turbulence and uncertainty, I hope Canadians are hopeful. I am hopeful because when you look at what we have in Canada, I I'd say let's seize the moment, let's be ambitious because in the economy of the 21st century, we have what you need to win. That's certainly what I say, and that's what... But obviously, you need to translate that in day to the issues of people and fighting for them. They want to see people who's in their corner and say, is this person going to fight for me? And my answer to them is, I'm fighting for you every single day. And that's what my colleagues I, are doing. I guess, to be blunt, I don't understand what that means. Like, you're essentially saying that because Canada is at the forefront of digitization, digitization relative to the rest of the world, that Canadians should feel OK, that the price of bread has increased 20 percent over the last three years, that they can't afford their rent, that they can't get a house, they can't buy a house, they can't even enter the housing market. And, and, and I understand, I'm not say, laying all of the blame for that at your feet. I, I understand. But you're coming out of this caucus retreat with say, telling Canadians, we're going to keep fighting, we're going to keep delivering, without putting a single new thing in the window to actually advance their interests at this moment in time or address their frustrations, other than telling them you're better off than other people in the rest, the rest of the world. 
Well, no, no, but that's not what I'm saying. Hold on. I'm saying they want people to be in their corner to fight for them. What we did, for example, on competition, what I did, for example, on grocery, what we're doing, the plan on housing, what we've been doing to make sure that life is Years more affordable. Years after the that's problem the type of crescendo. Thing that, but, but, but I would say, Avashi, what I was saying is that I hope Canadians are hopeful. We have, we have the fundamentals to be hopeful as a nation. Just look at the world. But what I'm saying, what I hear from people want to do, they want people to fight for them, to be in their corner. They understand that's what we're doing to, you know, bring more competition. They want to see, uh, have more choices that will bring prices down. Uh, that's what we're fighting for in every sector of the economy to make life more affordable. And we're going to keep on fighting for Canadians. They want to see someone in their corner. And when they look at the alternative, they know who has their back. Uh, they know who has the experience and expertise to deliver. And, and, you know, when I, and, you know, I tend to see a lot of folks on the street. They want to see someone who's fighting for them. That's what we're saying. We're going to fight for you. We'll let the other focus on themselves and political issues that only interest few people in Ottawa. I, I can tell you, in Nanaimo, Shawinigan, and, and Verdun, no one is talking about election. No one is talking about this game and ship. They say, you've been elected. Deliver for me. That's why we put you there. And that's what but we're I'm doing. Yeah, respectfully, Mr. I'm not asking about politics. I'm not asking about game and chef. I'm asking on behalf of Canadians who genuinely feel like they're suffering. When you say that you're there to fight for them, can you not, uh, I guess, sympathize with Canadians who feel you came very late to the game to fight for them? When you mentioned grocery prices and competition, it was over a year after prices spiked that your government finally acted in those areas. It took you a while to, quote, unquote, fight for Canadians as you claim you are. No, I'd say I would... You know, respectfully disagree. We were at the forefront of, of a number of issues. When it, when it's about, for example, bringing investment to seize the opportunity to decarbonize the economy, fighting for Canadians every day with respect to affordability. Listen, we presented the largest, um, I would say, amendments and I would say reform on competition that we have ever seen in this country. Everyone will tell you the best way you can do is to have more competition in every sector of the economy. That's fighting for Canadians. When I called the CEO and I said, you need to do your part to make sure that we stabilize prices in Canada. This had never been done before. So we're going to be fighting at every but step of the way. But that was six months after we're prices peaked. A plan. Listen, Vashi, are you going to blame us for doing something? I mean, we're acting for people. I, you know, your argument, I don't hear in the street, trust me. And I wish you would be with me on the street because people are saying, you're fighting for me. That's what I want to see. That's what I hear on the street. And I do meet a few people. Then why are you... Minister, why are you 20 points, points pardon me, behind the Conservatives and theirs for the last eight months? Listen, it's normal. I mean, don't, you have to look at the macro issue. It's, you see the same thing in other governments in other countries. There's a lot of frustration. There's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of things that are going. And normally you turn that to the elected leaders. But what I'm saying is that people want to see a team that is fighting for them. That is, they understand their issue, their day-to-day -day issue. They're concerned about the end of the week. That's why I'm saying we're redoubling our effort to make sure that their issue is our issue and we're fighting for them. That's what they want to see. They understand problems are complex. They understand slogans don't create jobs and videos and all that. That's not what's going to solve the, the problem of this nation. They want to see people who are going to be fighting, uh, bring a dose of optimism, because I do think as a country, we have to be optimistic about the future at the same time realizing the issue we need to work on. That's what we're doing. Okay, Minister, I'm out of time. I genuinely appreciate all your time tonight. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Have a nice day. Thank you very much.